Hello, good morning, welcome back to topic 16. So today what we're going to talk about is we are going to talk all about viral pathogenesis. So I think this topic is very relevant to what is going on currently during world events and I hope that you're excited for it. So what we're going to talk about in this topic is we're going to define what pathogenesis is and what virulence are and we're going to kind of compare and contrast them. And then we're going to think about what are some of the things that affect viral pathogenesis, how do we study human diseases, and then we're going to split the rest of this topic up into four parts where we're going to talk about patterns of infection, viral virulence, pathogenesis, and susceptibility. So let's go ahead and jump right in. And the first thing that I want to talk about is this idea that, yes, viruses can cause disease. And right now, of course, is a prime example of that. However, even though viruses cause disease, there is a huge but here. This is not their goal. Right? So if we think about it from the perspective of a virus, Causing disease is not the purpose of any viral reproduction strategy. The goal of a virus is to hijack a cell and to have that cell make more viral progeny. So the goal is not to cause disease. This is kind of more or less an accident. Oftentimes when viruses trigger disease, it's really the result of the host immune system. And so that's something to keep in mind as we walk through this lecture, is that even though we'll talk about all the different mechanisms by which viruses can cause disease, keep in mind that this is not their goal. And another thing that we have to mention is we're going to talk about what a pathogen is here and we're going to define it in a page or two, but what I first want to tell you is things that all pathogens must do. So although viruses are considered pathogens, we of course have pathogens that are fungal, bacterial, and regardless of the type of pathogen that you are, these are the five steps that all pathogens must do. So all pathogens must somehow enter the host. They have to establish or colonize. They must also spread through the host. They have to somehow defeat host immune system, and then they have to exit the host. And sometimes exiting the host may or may not cause damage within the host. So when we think about infections, we have to look at infections holistically. And before we get into that, we're going to start with some basic definitions. So oftentimes in the field of microbiology, virology, in general, we tend to use these words pathogenesis and virulence interchangeably. But we definitely should not as they are very different things. So we're going to start by first defining what disease is. And there are many definitions of disease. We're going to keep it pretty broad and we're going to say that disease is a negative change in a person's health. Next, let's get into this idea of a pathogen. So a pathogen is a microorganism or a microbe that can cause disease. So a pathogen is anything that can cause disease. The next thing that we have to think about is this idea of pathogenicity. And pathogenicity is defined as the ability to cause disease. And both of these, a pathogen or pathogenicity, these are both yes or no questions. So you either are a pathogen or you are not. Uh, now technically, you could be both. You could both be a pathogen and not be a pathogen depending on the environment. But when we are looking at this question, we are looking at it in that instance, in that host or in that particular environment. Is it a pathogen? Yes or no. So pathogenicity is just that ability to cause disease. So if we take that and we apply it to pathogenesis, we can define pathogenesis as the mechanism of causing disease. So pathogen, pathogenicity, pathogen pathogenesis, these are all yes, no things. Like, do you cause disease? Do you not cause disease? And how do you cause disease? So oftentimes people will say, oh, that's more pathogenic than that. And when they say that, they don't really mean to use pathogenic or pathogenicity. What they're really referring to 
is they're referring to this idea of virulence. And virulence is that degree of intensity. So I should say degree or intensity of pathogenicity. So again, when we talk about these ideas, it's important to keep in mind that when we say pathogen, we are really referring to a yes-no question. And when we talk about if something is more or less pathogenic, that's actually an incorrect use of the word. And what we're really referring to is the degree or intensity of pathogenicity, which is really virulence. So if we want to compare and say, oh, well, this is a worse pathogen than this one, what we're really trying to say is that this is more virulent than this pathogen. Okay, so now that we've got some of our basic ideas outlined, let's go ahead and get into some questions. So much of this lecture was designed to be a back and forth discussion between us. And since we're unable to do that, I'm going to go ahead and share some of the ideas that I have for these questions. And then in the comments, I want you all to add to any of the things that maybe I didn't say, maybe ideas you have or questions you have. So we're going to start with what are things that can affect viral pathogens? So even right now in the world, if we take a look at some of the statistics about all the patients who have coronavirus, we see that some people have a mild version, some have a more severe version. We see differences depending on the age and even on the sex. So right now we are seeing that biological males are dying at a higher rate than that of biological females. And so we can take all of those things and we can think about maybe this has something to do with viral pathogenesis. So let's actually write some of these things down. So we can add age, we can add biological sex. All of these things are going to affect viral pathogenesis. Perhaps even the organs that you have so if you are a person who is immunocompromised, that could potentially give a pathogen an edge, if you will. So if you are missing, say, your spleen, which plays a very important role in helping your immune system, you are considered immunocompromised. You might be immunocompromised because of the medication you're on, because you have another underlying disease, or maybe you're already sick with something else and so you would be considered immunocompromised. So other things that can affect viral pathogenesis is the population, right? So within the population, how many people are susceptible? Do we have immunity that exists within the population? We can also think about race. So perhaps um, based on environmental conditions, there are different genes at the genetic level that are, you know, maybe more conducive to one virus to infect versus another. So environment, you could even go as far as talking about who you live with. Um, so what is their cleanliness like? Um, your diet absolutely plays a role. Your lifestyle can play a role as well. Um, another really important thing is this idea of the rate of replication. And so it's really the rate of replication of the host cell, right? So is it a type of cell that normally replicates really quickly? If so, maybe the virus has evolved to use that cell because it knows, well, I say it knows very loosey-goosey here, but because it gives it the advantage of making more progeny than not. Um, another really big feature that we have not said yet is, of course, the immune system. And so history here is a really big point. So there's this hypothesis that is known as the hygiene hypothesis. And it essentially comes down to 
eating dirt. And so what I mean by that is when you are younger, the more things that you are exposed to. So like, you know, when we are kids and in sandboxes, we ate the dirt and whatnot. Or, you know, maybe your house is a little dirtier. And so the hypothesis is that when you're younger, the more things that you're exposed to, the more your immune system learns different types of antigens. And so you actually end up having a better immune system. So that's my excuse for when my mom comes over and she says that my house is not dusted. I tell her that I'm just practicing the hygiene hypothesis in case we ever have kids that, you know, I'll just be used to not cleaning the house. And really, it's just helping their future immune systems. So again, let me know if there are other things that you came up with that are not in this list. So the next question that we're going to talk about is this idea of, well, how do we study human diseases? And as you think about some of these um, ways that we study human diseases that I will both jot down on here, but that you also come up with, think about some pros and cons. So probably the main way that most people um, think about that we study human diseases, particularly now as we have an epidemic, is this idea of epidemiology. And so epidemiology is all about population studies. And at the end of the semester, we'll actually talk a little bit about epidemiology. So we'll get more into that idea. Um, Other ways that we can study human disease are her cell culture. And so for cell culture, this is really good for reproduction of viruses. So in lab before the semester, um, before we went on break and before we went online, we use cell culture as a means of studying the viruses that you all isolated. This is really good for reproducing and making more viruses. It's really good for some of that molecular cellular level stuff. Um, Not so great if you want to know whole organismal things. Um, Of course, we have things like animal models, right? You're not really going to get approved to test things out in humans. Um, I'm not sure of an IRB that would approve of that. So animal models are really great ways to study that. And so we have things like mice, monkeys, rabbits, um, armadillos, ferrets. We have all sorts of different what we refer to as, oh my goodness, what is the word that I'm looking for? Model animal models. There we go. Model organisms. I'm not sure why I can think of that. But so we have all sorts of different animal models depending on the disease. We can also do things like autopsies. So this is postmortem, but this gives us insight into human disease. We can also do biopsies. And so this is going to be, of course, limited, unfortunately, to the tissue that we're looking at. Um, We can do things like doing blood panels. So we can take a look at what kind of antibodies do people have. So this is something that the CDC recently announced that they were going to do, is to actually study how many people have antibodies against this novel coronavirus. So how many people have antibodies against SARS coronavirus 2 so that we can start to get a better understanding of, well, how many people are carriers of this disease and are spreading it but are asymptomatic? And we'll kind of touch back on that some more as well. So again, I encourage you with some of these things to, in the comments below, to share some of your thoughts and ideas. So we're going to talk a little bit more about this idea of animal models. Typically, when it comes to science, animal models of hearse are widely used. When it comes to things like drugs, and when we talk about antivirals, I will remind you of this, but we actually have to test a drug in at least two different animal models and show its efficacy before we move into humans. But As you can imagine, there can be many issues that are related to using animal models. And I'm going to share a quote with you. And this quote is a really good summary. And it's this idea that mice lie and monkeys exaggerate. 
And so oftentimes you've probably heard that, oh, in a mouse study, this drug has shown this, or in studies with monkeys, this has happened. So majority of drugs actually fail when they go from animal models to human models, or to humans, I should say. And this is because of this idea that my sly and monkeys exaggerate. And so we have a lot of different issues, right? So we can say that there's lots of even unknown unknowns. So in some ways, we don't even know why we don't know that these things don't work. Um, but I think over the next couple of years, we'll start to understand more, particularly as sequencing has become more and more of a used technique. I think we're going to learn more and more. But we, of course, have things like a size difference, right? We are much larger than a mouse. So that is an issue. What about metabolism? There can completely and utterly be different metabolic differences between the model organisms that we're using and us. So oftentimes, things don't translate, right? The organism might be a good model for one disease, but not for another. Other issues that we have are inbreeding. So in terms of mice, we oftentimes inbreed them a lot. There's a lot of genetic manipulation that is done to remove particular genes. And so you can imagine that those aren't very good models. In terms of humans, we're pretty genetically diverse. And so if you're doing a lot of inbreeding with your models that you're using, that's not really representative of the human gene pool. So again, there are a lot of issues potentially related to this, and I'm interested to hear what else you all have to add to this discussion in the comments below. So let's go ahead, now that we've introduced some of the pieces, let's go ahead and start moving into the different parts of this lecture. So we're going to start with the development of disease. So we said that disease is a negative change in a person's health. So graphically, how does this happen? What does this look like? So we're going to go ahead and draw a picture here. And on the x-axis, we're going to have time. And on the y, we're going to have severity of disease. And when we represent disease we have something that looks like this. And there's actually four different periods of, well, five technically. So five different periods of our development of disease. So I'm gonna try to color code these here. So let's start at the beginning here. This first part is called incubation. And for some of these pieces, we'll actually talk more details about them. So for incubation for now, let's just define it as the time between infection and your first symptoms. All right, so after incubation, <clears throat> you start to get something known as the prodromal period. And during the prodromal period, these are when you have your first symptoms. And they tend to be mild and nonspecific. And I like to refer to this as the ugh stage. So, you know when you're starting to get sick and you're like, oh, I have that scratch in my throat. Like, I just feel meh. I feel off. I feel like I'm starting to get sick. There's definitely something wrong. That's the prodromal period. So after the prodromal period, as you can see, we're kind of rising in our graph here. We are beginning to enter the period that we refer to as illness. And during the illness period, this is when you get the major symptoms. And these major symptoms are specific 
to the disease. And so in the case of coronavirus, of course, these are going to be the things like the coughs, the things associated with that respiratory illness. Now, after some time, you will start to enter what we refer to as the decline. And during the decline phase, your symptoms begin to subside. And of course, much of this is because our immune system has figured out the intruder and is kind of working on getting rid of that. And then the last stage that we have is convalescence. And during convalescence, so during this stage, we begin to regain strength. So again, this is what a typical development of disease pattern looks like. So if this is what development looks like, and we've kind of brainstormed some ideas of viruses and pathogenicity and virulence, let's think more about, well, what are some of the characteristics of disease? So for a particular virus or for even other pathogens, what are some of the things that we might be looking at or the things that people might be interested in studying. So I will share some of my ideas with you, and then we'll actually go into more detail about some of them. But again, I want you all to share some of your ideas in the comments below. So one of the things that probably comes to mind is, of her symptoms. So not all symptoms are the same for every single disease. We can also think about how is the disease spread. So that is definitely a characteristic of disease. So right now for the coronavirus, um, we think that it is spread mostly in close contact um, through larger droplets, and there is some potential evidence and some discussion of is it airborne and if it is what they're really referring to is that smaller droplets that kind of hang out a little longer in the air are also able to hold the virus and it's able to be passed on that way but most of our evidence suggests that um, because the virus can survive on the surf on different surfaces for a couple hours to a couple days depending on what it is made up of a sick person might touch that a healthy person might touch it touch their face their eye, their mouth, their nose, and then the virus infects that way. So how is the virus spread? How is the disease spread? This is definitely a characteristic. Um, Hearst, we mentioned this idea of incubation, and we'll come back to incubation as well. Even severity, right? So how severe is the disease? That is definitely going to be a characteristic as well. What type of damage to the host is done. So is there destruction of cells? Is there death? So in the case of the current outbreak, we see that this coronavirus causes lesions in the lungs. So what kind of things happen there? We can also think about viral reproduction as a whole. So how many viruses are produced? Where are the viruses produced? So we can also think about duration as well. So how long are you sick for? Are we talking a couple days, a couple weeks, to your entire lifetime? So all of these things are characteristics of disease. So there are, of course, many other ones that I'm not listing here. And like I said, I want to hear the ones that you all have to share. But we are going to talk a little bit more detail about a couple of characteristics of disease. And the first characteristic of disease that we're going to talk about is this idea of the infected cell. And for this characteristic, this is really talking about what happens to the infected cell. So what I mean by that is, is the cell killed? Is the cell left alive? Um, what kind of things happen? So what type of infections do we have by what type of viruses? So we're going to introduce a couple new definitions here. And the first thing that we're going to talk about is a cytopathic virus. So cytopathic viruses are ones that kill cells rapidly and make lots of new viral particles. 
And so as we're defining some of these things, start to think about examples of viruses that you know and which ones could fit into these different categories. And as we continue, we'll actually start categorizing some viruses into these. We can also have things that are non-cytopathic viruses. So you can imagine that these are going to release viral progeny, but they don't cause immediate cell death. And then last but not least, we're also going to think about this idea of abortive infections. And in abortive infections, we neither kill nor make any progeny. So maybe the virus infected a host cell that can't actually support and make any viral progeny, or maybe there's something wrong with the virus itself. It's missing something from its genome. So we would refer to these as an abortive infection. So all of these things and what happens to the infected cell as a whole, these are all considered a characteristic of disease. So another characteristic of disease that is really important that we're going to talk about is the incubation period. So we define the incubation period as the time between when you're infected and when you show your first symptom. So something to think about is during this time, well, what is happening? Why do we call this the incubation period? So during this time, we are replicating viral genomes so we're working on making more virus because our cells have been hijacked. And then we start to have the innate immune system respond. And our innate immune system is our first line of defense. And it's not specific. All right, so something to keep in mind during incubation period, and this is something that particularly I have seen a lot of on the news, I've seen a lot of people on Twitter talking about it, but this idea of incubation versus infectious period. And I really like this image because I think it does a really nice job of kind of highlighting some of those pieces. So on the x-axis here, we have essentially time, and then on the y, we've kind of got this idea of how many viruses are there. So during that incubation period, again, this is going to be the time between when you're infected and when you first show symptoms. So here, really, we have viral progeny being made. So we have a lot of viral reproduction that is happening. And then on the right here, we have our infectious period. And for the infectious period, this is when the host is what we refer to as shedding viruses that can be transmitted to others. Now, for this idea of incubation versus infectious period, this image is kind of showing them back to back, but it turns out you can be infectious while you're still in the incubation period. So sometimes these overlap, and really great examples of that are going to be things like um, herpes viruses and measles. So for the chicken pox, before you even get some of your major symptoms, like before you get the pox rash, which we'll talk about here in a little bit, you are actually infectious. So even though you are both in the incubation period, you're also in the infectious period. The same thing is true with measles. And recent data from this coronavirus outbreak is suggesting that that is also true for this coronavirus, that many people, before they even get their first symptom, appear to still be infectious. And so just because they are two separate things doesn't mean that they necessarily happen independent of one another. But just like there are examples of viruses where the infectious period can also overlap with the incubation period, there are examples of viruses where they're most definitely very separate entities. So a really great example is, an, is Ebola. So for Ebola during the incubation period, the patient is not infectious, but as soon as we have the first symptom, that is when the infectious period begins. So again, this is something to think about is that this idea of incubation versus 
versus infectious periods, that they sometimes overlap and sometimes don't. And so for these initial symptoms that we have, remember if we think back to this graph that we drew here, our initial symptoms are part of the prodromal. They're more mild and nonspecific and they're that ugh feeling. And so those initial symptoms are going to be things like fever. They're going to be things like just general malaise, aches, pains, nausea. And those symptoms are due to our immune system recognizing that there is a foreign body. So kind of thinking about this idea of incubation periods, I wanted to go ahead and share some common incubation periods with you. For influenza virus up here, we can see that the incubation period is pretty short. It's one to two days. For rhinovirus, it's one to three days. For Ebola, it can be a two to 21. And as we kind of work down this chart, we can see that that incubation period gets longer and longer. So for example, for papilloma, it's about 50 to 150 days. For rabies, it's between 30 to 100 days. Part of the reason for that is it depends on, usually you get rabies by being bit by a rabid animal. So it depends on where the animal bites you and where the virus enters. So the virus typically replicates. Um, it heads towards the brain, and so depending on how long it takes to get there, that's why that incubation period can kind of be longer there. And so the key point here is that these incubation periods are going to differ for different viruses. And you'll notice that we have long ones and we have short ones. So typically when we have shorter replication or shorter incubation periods, re that replication happens at the primary site. So that means that replication of the virus occurs where it enters. So in the case of influenza or flu, it is a respiratory virus. You're, it's gonna enter usually through the nose or the mouth. It's gonna start replicating there. And so it has a shorter incubation incubation period. For these longer incubation periods, the symptoms go beyond the primary site. So that's why with rabies, you get bit maybe on your hand, but the symptoms are going to be beyond that site where the virus first entered. So the virus might start replicating there, but it might also move on further and so on and so forth. So with our current outbreak that we have, um, papers are suggesting that the median incubation period for this coronavirus seems to be about five days, and most people will develop their symptoms by about 11 and a half days, but it can be as long as 14 days, which is part of the reason why the quarantine, if you are exposed or think you are exposed or get diagnosed, is 14 days. All right, so now that we've kind of pretty extensively talked about this idea of incubation periods, let's talk about another characteristic of disease, and that is this idea of duration of disease. So how long are you sick? And typically, we split this up into this idea of acute infections and persistent infections. So you've probably heard some of these terms being thrown around. So let's start with acute infections. So acute infections are usually rapid and we say that they're self-limiting. And so they can be short and severe. And one thing to keep in mind with acute infections is that you can have an asymptomatic infection. And that seems to be a lot of what we are seeing with the coronavirus. So there are some papers that are suggesting and some scientists and doctors that are suggesting that a third or two third of the people that we're not actually counting or seeing because they're not getting tested might have an asymptomatic acute infection. So as we talk about these different durations of diseases, we're gonna draw a couple of charts that represent that. So they're all gonna have the same axis, so I'm only gonna label the first one. We're gonna have time on the x-axis, and we're going to have viral production 
on the y-axis. So for an acute infection, we're going to see a really quick rise and a really quick fall. And really great examples of this are going to be influenza, rhinovirus, things like rotaviruses, um, the different coronaviruses that circle that circulate as well could also be in this category. And for persistent infections, these tend to be long term and this is going to be really common for non-cytopathic viruses. And when persistent infections, <clears throat> excuse me, when persistent infections happen, the primary infection, which is acute, is not cleared. And because that primary or acute infection is not cleared in a persistent infection, this is going to last the lifetime of a host. And we can actually look at persistent infections and break them up into a couple of different graphs depending on the virus type. So for a persistent infection, we can have something that looks like this. We see an increase in viral reproduction or viral production and that kind of holds true. So you always produce virus even at a low level. And oftentimes when this happens, patients tend to be asymptomatic. And a really great example of this is a human polyomavirus. So JC virus is also known as human polyomavirus 2. And when patients have this virus, they tend to be symptomatic, but they're always at a low level producing these polyomaviruses. You can also have something that looks more like this, where we see an increase in, reprodu in production and then a decrease for most of the host life and then an increase near the end. And really great examples of this are HIV. Um, we can also see this in something called measles, SSPE. So the SSPE stands for subacute sclerosing panencephalitis defective measles. And so what this is, is this is a defective measles virus that is not the entire virion. So the whole virion is not made but just the nucleocapsid protein is made for this virus. And so what we see is this um, sclerosing panencephalitis in patients. And so again, another one that we are probably more familiar with, and I'm gonna call this a subtype, is this idea of a latent infection. And the latent infection really is a persistent infection. Um, so you can think of it as a subtype. And for a latent infection, this is going to begin as acute, as they all do, and then no particles are made, but they can be reactivated. So what I mean by that and probably the best example is herpes virus. So you might see different reactivations throughout the host life cycle, and maybe there's only one, maybe there's two. It completely depends on the host and the virus. And so, again, we see these a lot with different herpes viruses. Okay, so even though we have said that you can have acute infections, you can have persistent infections. It turns out, of course, that you can technically be both. So we have said that persistent infections start as acute infections and then can become latent infections. So we're going to talk about an example of a disease that does that. And the example that we're going to talk about is herpes zoster. So when we think about 
chicken pox, um, I always like to say one virus, but two different diseases. So most of you have probably received your vaccine. Um, you are in the generation that at that point they had a vaccine for chicken pox. So most of you have probably not had chicken pox, but people in my generation and older, most of us were unfortunate enough to actually experience the chicken pox. And I remember when I had it, I think I was in third or fourth grade and it was absolutely horrible. I had so many spots everywhere and it was absolutely miserable. But for the chicken pox, this is actually a virus that begins as an acute infection and then becomes latent. So you've probably heard of shingles. So herpes zoster can cause chicken pox and it can cause shingles as well. And probably the most annoying thing about this virus is that even though it's the same virus causing the two different diseases, we have to give it two different names, which just drives me batty. So herpes zoster, herpes varicella, they're both the same thing, but for whatever reason, we've decided to give them two names. So just something to keep in mind. And um, you all have probably heard of this in the news at different time points, but if not, it's kind of an interesting story, but this idea of chicken pox parties. So when I was younger, people used to actually have in-person chicken pox parties. So when someone in your class would get the chicken pox, that family would invite all of the kids in the class over so that everyone would get exposed to it with the thought being, well, it's going to go around in the classroom anyway, so let's just get all the kids sick and then they'll get better. So now, of course, those have been outlawed. Now we know, well, we probably shouldn't be doing that because herpes virus sticks around in the nucleus. And so we have a vaccine instead. But now you can actually do online um chicken pox parties. And so what people have started doing is they, well, if their child has chicken pox, they'll have their child lick like lollipops or, you know, spit into something and then they can actually send it to you over the mail or through the mail so that you can then infect your child with the chicken pox as well. So anywho, I digress. Let's talk about how this actually happens and what goes on. So the first thing that has to happen, and we're going to use this image here to kind of walk us through it, is that the virus gets in and this is going to happen in tip, usually the respiratory tract, but it can also happen through the conjunctiva, so through your eyes. So different ways to enter, but usually it's gonna be the mouth, the eyes, the nose, and um, then the virus is going to spread to the lymph nodes. So we see that here, and this is the first round of infection. And when the virus is in the lymph nodes, we of course get the typical viral life cycle. So we get viral reproduction that occurs. So um, after we get spread to the lymph nodes of the virus, we get our first round of infection. We then get spread and replication in T cells. And so these T cells, we call this viremia or viruses in the blood. These T cells are actually infected. And so as these T cells spread, they're going to spread throughout the whole body. So a really good way to get the virus everywhere. And again, this idea is called viremia, which is just that viruses are present in blood or lymph. So we call this um, secondary viremia as it's spreading to some of the other organs. So eventually because the T cells are spread, these viruses get to the liver, the spleen, and other organs. And then this continues spreading until about two weeks later, the virus is going to infect skin cells. And so at this point, this is probably about the time that we will develop what we refer to as the pox rash. And this is not actually due to the virus. It's actually due to our immune response. 
So a lot of the rashes that we get from different viruses are actually due to our immune system kind of freaking out about them and not necessarily the virus itself, although of course it is still a sign and a symptom that we'd look for. So after we get the pox rash and the virus has infected the skin cells, you know, our bodies of her start to realize that this is happening. And eventually what we have, what we have happen is the virus is going to spread to what we refer to as the dorsal root ganglia of the nervous system. So, of course, we have our nervous system that runs throughout an entire body. So, we have all of these nerves and neurons. And so, we have sensory neurons that um, go to the sur- almost the surface of our skin. And so, that's how we can sense temperature, humidity, you know, um, so on and so forth, pain, those types of things. And so the virus at this point is infecting the skin cells and replicating in there. And so we know that for herpes virus, what they do is they can actually hang out in the nucleus. And that's exactly what happens. The virus will infect one of the nerve cells. And so we say the dorsal root ganglia. So dorsal refers to the backside. Um, And so the virus essentially hangs out in these nerve cells and we call this establishing latency and then what can happen is it can come back as shingles and typically if you know or have heard of anyone that has shingles, it usually comes back in one part of the body. And so unlike chicken pox, where it's kind of spread everywhere, the um, when you get shingles, it usually comes back in one location. So I had a student last year who said their mom got it and their mom had it on one side of their face. And where you get it is actually indicative of where and which nerves the virus went latent in. So our nerves definitely have location. And even though they all kind of connect back together, um, where the virus kind of hangs out and goes dormant, and then when it comes out, gives us evidence of which area of your body it was hanging out in. And so, again, because not every single cell that has the virus is going to go latent and it depends on the cell type that does, we, when you get shingles, we can kind of figure that part out. And so, I've never had shingles, but I have been told by my husband's patients that it is very, very painful. So, um, I can guarantee you when I turn 50, I will definitely be there um, probably on the day of my birthday waiting to get my shingle shot because if I do get shingles and it's even half as bad as chicken pox was, I really don't want that to happen because I had a horrible case of chicken pox. Okay, so now that we've covered this idea of duration of diseases and hopefully I've convinced you that even though we can have persistent and acute infections, persistent infections do start as acute. So chicken pox started as acute, becomes persistent or latent as it comes back as shingles. We're now going to talk about viral reproduction. And this is going to be a little bit of a throwback to Bio 161. So in Bio 161, we talk about this idea of R selection and K selection. And hopefully you all are at least nodding your head a little bit or scratching your head saying, hmm, that sounds familiar. So let me tell you what R and what K selection is. So for R selection, this is this idea of having lots of progeny. And we say that the progeny are low quality. So you're not investing a lot of energy, but you have a lot of progeny. For K, you have little progeny, but we say that they're high quality and that's because we are investing a lot of time and energy into those progeny. And so in ecology, when we think about these principles, you know, the environment of Hearst helps figure out which one will predominate in terms of um, 
what is going to occur. Do we have more progeny or less progeny? And of course, there are a lot of variables that have to be considered here. But this ecological principle and these equations, which we're not going to walk through, I promise you, I know they're pretty complex, um, but all of these can actually be applied to viral reproduction. So let's think about that a little bit. So when we have these R selection and K selection, we talked about acute and persistent infections. Which infections do you think would be considered R selection and which do you think would be considered K selection? So I'm going to tell you the answer, but in the comments below, let me know if you got it right. So let's talk about R for a second. So for our R selection, what we say is that this idea of viral reproduction is going to continue and it won't reach a limit as long as susceptible hosts are available. Okay, so if we think about this idea as not reaching a limit as long as susceptible hosts are available, if we have time on the x-axis and we have n on the x, we're going to get something that looks like this. So exponential growth, it's going to increase as long as susceptible hosts are available. And typically for these R selection viruses, what we see is we see extensive viral spread. So spreading very, very quickly. And we tend to say that these infections can burn out, if you will, if there are no hosts. And so if you said that these are most likely to be acute infections, you are absolutely correct. So when we think about acute infections, we said those are the ones that come on really quick, make a lot of progeny, we get better. So these are going to be viruses that are going to have a lot of progeny, you know, and um, they're going to spread very, very quickly throughout the population. Now, on the other hand, of course, we have our K selection. So, for our K selection, we're going to say that these are going to be our persistent or our latent viruses. And for these, when we have the host surviving for extended periods of time, this idea of faster viral reproduction, it doesn't confer any selective advantage to the virus. And so what we see, if we have time again on the x-axis, we see more logistic growth. And of course, this dashed line here on the top, this is K, and this is going to be the limit to reproduction. And so again, these are going to be more persistent and more of those latent infections for viruses. So we're going to talk a little bit more about both acute and persistent infections. So let's go ahead and start with our acute infections. And just like we drew a graph for the progression of disease, we're going to draw a graph for what a typical acute infection is going to look like. So we're going to have duration or time on the x-axis and then we're going to put viral growth on the y-axis. And this graph is going to look very similar to our duration of disease, so same type of shape. We're going to add a little line here on the bottom and kind of fill this part in. This is our innate defense. And this shows the amount of virus, roughly, that has to be present, if you will, for our innate immune system to recognize that there is an issue. So starting on the left and working our way to the right, we're going to have the first part of the graph is going to be this idea of establishing 
infection. And so this is the duration of disease or those things that all pathogens have to do. They have to get in and they have to um, colonize. So this is going to be that colonized part. So they're establishing infection. And then as that increases in terms of the viral growth, at the very top here where viral growth peaks, we're going to have our adaptive immune system that is going to finally kick in. And after it kicks in and it recognizes that there is an issue, we're going to start to see a decrease. And so this is going to be adaptive response. So even though at this stage our innate immune system has responded and we probably have fever, we have inflammation, we're starting to let our body know that there's a foreign invader, it's still not specific. So it's not until the adaptive immune system learns what is going on that this becomes specific. And then everything to the right of that is memory. So once we have been exposed to something, we of course have memory of it. And you can probably, hopefully at this point, you're guessing that based on everything we have said, that in terms of acute infections, these are the ones that are most frequently associated with serious outbreaks. So we would classify the coronavirus outbreak that we have right now as an acute infection. So recall that for these acute infections, they're short, we get lots of progeny, symptoms tend to resolve pretty fast, we get a rapid production of those viral particles, um, and even though just because they are short does not mean that they are not severe or cannot be severe. So let me show you a couple of persistent and latent infections. So recall that for persistent and latent infections, infection is not cleared. And this is very common for non-cytopathic viruses. And for these persistent or latent infections, the cells that harbor that latent viral genome are poorly recognized by the host immune system. So that's part of the reason why we cannot clear it. And you might be wondering, why do we get reactivation? What causes that? A lot of the reactivation is caused by host stress and it could be caused to damage to the cell that the virus is hanging out in. So oftentimes when we see um, in the case of shingles, you know, it could be a very traumatic event that causes it, a very stressful time in the host's life, um, maybe damage that occurs to the cell that the virus is hanging out in. So all of these things are things that can lead to reactivation. And that is also true when it comes to viruses that infect bacteria and undergo a lysogenic life cycle, which of course is a persistent type of life cycle. I am showing you a table that has a bunch of different persistent viral infections. And by no means do I want you to memorize this or anything like that. This is just letting you know the different example types that we know of and kind of where they persist, so their site, so where they're hanging out, the type of cells that they survive in, and then their consequence. So we have, of course, adenovirus here, which is a DNA virus. It hangs out in the lymphocytes and the tonsils. We have not really learned of the consequences of it. You'll notice here that we have Hodgkin's disease, um, Burkitt's lymphoma, and so this is caused by Epstein-Barr virus. Virus. Um, here is our zoster or our shingles down here. Of course, HIV and AIDS. We see cold sores and genital herpes. You'll notice that we have leukemia, papillomas, carcinomas. So about 20% of viruses that infect humans are associated with human cancer. So we will actually have an entire lecture just on that as well. All right, so we are going to end this topic for now, so end day one, I should say, with thinking about 
how is latency established? So in that table that I just showed you, there was a mixture of DNA viruses, of RNA viruses. So based on what you've learned thus far in this class, um, I would like you all to hypothesize how this can happen. And I'm going to give you a couple of ideas and then let me know in the comments below if these match up with what you came up with or if you have other ones. So one thing that can happen is you can hide out in a cell that doesn't replicate. So if there's a virus that is in a cell that doesn't replicate, that virus will not be reproduced, but it can literally kind of just hang out and chill in that cell. And um, other things that of course we see in the case of the retroviruses are things like integrating into the host cell genome. So we see that a lot. Um, and then of course Latasha's favorite thing, so epigenetics. So we can, of course, have epigenetics or any type of nucleosome modification. So we've talked about in this class how that occurs. And when you have integration into that host cell genome, anytime that host reproduces that host cell, the viral genome also replicates. Um, in the case of epigenetics and nucleosome modification, there are some viruses that can actually um, use our histones and they wrap around them and they hang out and essentially become a heterochromatin that is found in the host as well. So lots of different ways and again let me know in the comments below what else you came up with or if there's anything that I missed. So we're going to stop topic 16 day one at the end of part one here when we come back in day two we are going to pick up with viral virulence and so we're going to talk more about that and we're going to get into some examples of genes and proteins that viruses have that help them become virulent so thanks for hanging out with me everyone have a great day and i'll catch you in the next one